Hi guys, Kieran here from A Clever Chimp. Now, it's been over a week since the Prime Minister here in the UK has asked us to stay indoors and limit going outside as much as possible. And if we do have to go outside to practice social distancing to the best of our ability. In the meantime, I realised that as I was reading the news and seeing these phrases like flattening the curve and maybe you've seen this R0 number pop up as well I kind of realised I didn't understand an awful lot about that I knew what, what they were saying it meant but I didn't understand why it meant what it meant, right? So I started looking into it, okay? And what I found was one of the most common mathematical models talked about was called this SIR model, right? And it's to do with a fixed population and within that population you have a susceptible amount of people, an infected amount of people, and an amount of people that have either recovered or unfortunately died from the disease. Now it goes without saying, but I'm no epidemiologist, right? And the complexities of the coronavirus are far beyond the scope of this video, far beyond the scope of this mathematical model, and far beyond the scope of the research that I've done. However, that doesn't mean that a simple mathematical model can't be enlightening. I certainly found it enlightening. With that being said, let's start building this mathematical model. So the model assumes that it's a fixed population, a fixed amount of people. So no births or immigration or deaths, uh, you know, unrelated to the infection are accounted for, okay? And it assumes that we're in this big mixing bowl, right? And we're all as equally likely to bump into one another, okay? And when we're setting up this mathematical model, we need to think about how things are going to change from now until a little bit after now, as opposed to, because we don't know what's going to be happening in a month's time. I don't think anybody knows what's going to be happening in a month's time, but we can have a little idea of what's going to happen from now till after now, okay? So how do you think the susceptible population are going to be changing? What's going to be affecting that rate of change? Well, you'd have a hard time arguing that it's going to be anything but negative because we're expecting the susceptible population to decrease as they become infected and move into the infected population, right? But it also depends on the number of people infected, yeah? Because they're the only people that can do the infecting and actually make the susceptible people infected. But we also need to determine and have a way of controlling the number of times an infectious person makes an infectious contact with another person, be it susceptible, recovered, or even their own kind, their own infected people. So we'll just say that that's an infectious contact constant. So we'll say for now, so that we can think about what's going to be happening, uh, we'll say that an infected person goes out once every two days. So in other words, 50% of the infected population goes out and tries to make an infectious contact. So therefore, what are the chances that they're going to bump into a susceptible person? Well, that's where we have to involve the actual amount of susceptible people left. Because if there's lots of susceptible people left, then the chances of an infectious person bumping into a susceptible person is much higher, as opposed to if there's a very small amount of susceptible people left, then the chances are that the infected people are just going to bump into themselves or bump into a recovered person, right? So therefore, that has to be involved in the differential equation. So how do we think the infected population are going to be changing? Well, we've just said that they're going to infect the susceptible population at that rate. So therefore, anybody that's infected in the susceptible population are going to be moving into the infected population. So we can just add what we've just worked out there into the infected population. And therefore, now we need to think about how people are going to be leaving the infected population. These are going to be the people that are no longer infectious. They've either recovered or unfortunately died from the infection. And we can do that in a similar way where we have a constant that controls the amount of people that are going to be leaving the infected group into the recovered group a day. And we can say that Say, say for now, we'll just call that a recovered constant, okay? And we'll say that they are going to be recovering 
every six days. So one person recovers every six days, or in other words, a sixth of the population, of, of the infected population, recovers a day, okay? And that kind of answers our next question of how are the recovered population going to be changing? Anybody that's gonna be leaving the infected population are gonna be going into the recovered population. So we can just add on that last term into the, into the recovered population. So let's now run a simulation of these differential equations using the infectious contact constant as one infectious contact every two days and the recovery constant as one recovery every six days. And let's say we'll, we'll run it with the 2018 population of the UK. So 66.44 million, according to Google. And uh, let's say that 10 people, only 10 people were infected initially, okay? Let's see how it works. Let's see what happens. Now, as you can see, it's not great news for this hypothetical population because over 90% of them have had to have caught the disease and either recovered or unfortunately died from it. But weirdly enough, it looks like nothing's changing at the start. It looks like nothing's going on. And then all of a sudden we get this exponential growth in the infected population. But that's the thing with exponential growth. That's why it's so hard to control is because exponential growth has been occurring ever since the start of the simulation. But it's because exponential growth, the key thing about it is that the rate at which it changes is dependent on the value that it holds at that current time. So at the start, the value is very small. So the rate at which it's changing is very small. But then it builds, it snowballs, and then you have the situation where then you have actually quite a significant amount of people that are infected. And therefore, the rate at which it's going to change then is much, much bigger. So let's have a closer look at that infected peak. Before the peak, there were more people joining the infected population than there were leaving, as in recovering or unfortunately dying from the infection. So therefore, the rate at which it was changing was positive. After the peak, more people were recovering or unfortunately dying from the uh, infection than there were people joining the infected population. So therefore, the rate at which the infected population was changing was negative. So we can say then that at the peak, at the, at the summit of the peak, the rate at which the infected population was changing was zero. And that's quite an important part of this graph because that's when we're on the decline. That's when we're, when we're, when we can see the light at the end of the tunnel, essentially. So let's set the rate at which the infected population is changing to zero in this differential equation. And we can rearrange this now to get this equation, where this term is the R naught number. This is what determines the R naught number, okay? And as you can see that if the R naught number is greater than one, then the rate at which the infected population is changing is positive. If the R naught number is less than one, then the rate at which the infected population is changing is negative. So how can we work out the R naught number for the simulation that we've just run? Well, we said that a person makes an infectious contact once every two days, and the same person would recover after six days. Okay, so in that case, they could potentially go out and make three infectious contacts during their infectious period, right? That gives us an R naught number of three with 100% of our population, so at the start, okay? This actually then means that in order for our R naught number to equal one, there has to only be a third of the susceptible population remaining. Or in other words, two thirds of the susceptible population have to have become infected in order for us to reach the summit of our infection peak. That's not great news for this hypothetical population because they're only reaching the peak once two thirds of their population have been infected. So what if we said that they made one infectious contact every three days instead of two days? Because in all honesty, there's only a minority of the population 
that can affect the recovery rate, that being doctors and scientists and researchers coming up with cures or vaccines or whatever. So for now, we might as well just keep that as it is. And the thing that we can change is the rate at which people make infectious contacts. So let's just say that they make it once every three days. That makes our R0 number two, which then means that we'll hit the peak of the infected population when there are 50% of the susceptible population remaining. This is a far better scenario than an R0 number of three. So in, in real sort of terms now, how can we change the rate at which people make infectious contacts? Well, you've all heard it already, and more than likely you're doing it. We're in lockdown, we're washing our hands as much as we can, and we're trying so desperately to not touch our face. And if we do go outside, then we're not touching each other with a six foot barge pole, right? That is what will change this number. That's what will change the amount of infectious contacts a day. And that's what we can all change. We don't just have to wait for the recovery rate to get better. We can all change the rate in which the infectious contacts are made. So let's take that R0 number down another peg now and say that the population makes an infected contact once every four days. In that case, what happens to the infected population curve is, well, it flattens out. It slows the rate at which the infection is spreading and it prolongs it. So that this, in this population, this hypothetical population, their healthcare system and their healthcare workers and all of the hospitals are not overwhelmed with the amount of people looking for care and need in order to survive the epidemic. And on that note, I want to bring it slightly more back to reality and say thank you to all of the essential workers here in the UK keeping this country going. And I want to thank everybody in the NHS for doing everything they can to keep as many of us alive throughout this pandemic. And for everyone else at home watching this, including me, we will carry on doing what we can. We will carry on washing our hands until they're chapped and we'll carry on trying not to touch our face and we'll make sure to not go outside unless absolutely necessary so that then we may flatten out that infected population curve and stamp down on that R0 number.